In this video, I'm going to be talking about the absorption of calcium and magnesium. So the two sort of primary, what are called divalent cations. So meaning they have a two plus charge. And so this is a, a topic with a lot of information out there. And I debated exactly how much to put into this video. Uh, I decided to go with kind of a, a uh, smaller route and just sort of hit the main highlights. Um, if you are interested in this, obviously there will be uh, references, so links to the papers that I use for all this down below. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm going to put my sort of extended lecture notes down there. And so the lecture notes are actually going to contain a lot more than what I'm actually even going to talk about in this video. But if you find this stuff interesting, then I would highly recommend uh, looking at those two things. So the lecture notes and then the references, which are both long enough that I'm just going to link to some PDFs of each of them in the description down below. All right, so anyway, to get started, I'm going to first talk about calcium absorption. And so this, I mean, both of these things are still uh, areas of sort of active research. So a lot of this stuff, you know, hasn't been fully fleshed out. I mean, you can even see on this figure here, they have, you know, like this, this endoplasmic reticulum question mark here. And so, you know, there is quite a bit of stuff on this that is still not fully fleshed out. And also, the other thing to notice is when you see this 125OH2D3, that is vitamin D. And so one thing that most people know about vitamin D is that it is involved in calcium absorption. And so what we have here, so this is showing uh, several different pathways for uh, calcium absorption. So we have this hyperpolarization one which is what's going on when we are in sort of a fasted state. So when we are, uh, when we haven't like just eaten a big meal. And so this is how calcium is absorbed uh, when there is sort of less food in our digestive tract where this depolarized state. So things like glucose, for instance, are depolarizers. So it's talking about the, the, uh, electric potential across the membrane here. And so uh, we see that this is saying that uh, that there is sort of a uh, minus 47 uh, millivolt uh, potential across the membrane here. And that actually changes depending on whether we have just eaten or not. So essentially how much food is actually in the intestine. And so the paper that I got this from was talking about how this uh, TRPV6 pathway here was thought for quite a while to be sort of the primary way in which calcium is taken up. And that is the uh, vitamin D dependent pathway. Uh, but they are showing that there is actually this, um, this other uh, channel here that they call the CAV1.3. And so this one is also taking up uh, calcium. And like I said, that is taking it up primarily, you know, sort of right after we have eaten. Uh, and so this is, uh, I mean, I'm not going to read through this whole thing uh, because I have it sort of um, simplified down here. And so in terms of extending the current perspective on calcium absorption, so like I said, they are... Uh, extending the current perspective by saying it's not just this TRPV6, but it's also this uh, calcium V1.3 here. Uh, the simplest proposal is that rapid changes in calcium absorption during digestion occur as a quant consequence of alternate depolarization and repolarization during and between digestive periods. The changes are achieved by alteration in the contributions of vitamin D independent uh, CAV 1.3 and vitamin D dependent TRPV6 respectively in response to changes in VM, which is the electric potential. 
In this view, the uh, CAV 1.3 plays the dominant role during digestion, especially when diet and calcium are plentiful, so that TRPV6 activity is downregulated genomically and inhibited by changes in the potential when glucose concentrations at the apical membrane reach, you know, some uh, 30 to 100 millimolar. And so it's saying that glucose sort of near the membrane here, which sort of, uh, which sort of depolarizes the membrane is actually uh, sort of causing it to go more towards this uh, sort of absorption pathway rather than this uh, hyper polarization. All right, other depolarizing digestion products such as amino acids and peptides may activate the CAV 1.3 and inhibit the TRPV6. Moreover, depolarization is augmented by increased synthesis of disaccharides and other nutrient transporters. On the other hand, TRPV6 plays a dominant role as a powerful scavenger under polarizing conditions between meals. And so this is actually data for the different polarizations. So the resting uh, potential here is the minus uh, 47 millivol millivolts. And so we see in red here this uh, CAV 1.3. And uh, this graph is, you know, it's kind of weird. So this I over I max is sort of like the, uh, I guess, the, the absorption divi divided by the maximum absorption to sort of uh, normalize it. And then they put a negative in front of it. I'm not exactly sure why they do that. But uh, so this, when we're at this minus one, that is when we are at the highest absorption rate. Uh, and so they do that normalization so that it goes uh, between sort of zero and minus one rather than, you know, zero and you know, some other big number. Uh, but anyway, so we see here the TRPV6 when we are more polarized. So as we polarize this way, uh, we actually get more and more absorption with the TRPV6. Whereas when we depolarize going this way, we see we get more with the CAV1.3. Uh, and so this is showing, uh, like I said, that we get these different differential sort of absorption rates with these two different uh, these two different ion channels depending on the polarization of the the uh, the cell or across the cell membrane there. And so that's what that was saying there. Uh, so the other thing to notice too is that we also have what are called paracellular or uh, passive sort of um, absorption here. So that's actually going down between the cells. And I'll actually talk about this quite a bit more when I get to magnesium, because this is actually the main pathway for magnesium absorption, but uh, it has to go through these tight junctions here. And so uh, there is this passive sort of diffusion between the cells, though uh, there seems to be some controversy among the papers about how much this actually happens with calcium. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons I'm not going to go into that too much here, just because there's, you know, a lot to wade through as far as, you know, how much uh, that actually contributes to it. And of course, there is also this paracellular secretion. Uh, and that actually reminds me in the previous video when I talked about sodium uh, absorption, there is actually this sodium secretion as well. And there was one paper I found on that that said that sodium is sort of uh, constantly secreted even as you're taking it up. So there's sort of, you know, uh, so, so there's sort of a loop of sodium because sodium, as we see over here, and I'll talk about it more in a future video on the macronutrient absorption, that sodium is actually needed for glucose absorption. Uh, but anyway, I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole just yet. Uh, so I also have this over here. So in humans, dietary calcium intake approximates about 1,000 milligrams a day, of which 400 milligrams is absorbed. 
uh, so about a 40% uh, sort of uh, bioavailability, I guess you could say. During steady state, calcium absorption occurs predominantly in the small intestine. Calcium homeostasis, which refers to the maintenance of serum calcium concentration between 8.5 and 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and that's controlled by the parathyroid hormone and some of these other hormones, which I'm not going to get into two here because that is more about uh, so sort of the resorption of calcium from the bones and things like that, which I will get into in uh, in future videos. And I'll get into this other stuff here after I talk about uh, magnesium. So down here, I just wanted to point out, so they were looking at uh, serum calcium uh, percentage uh, and so it's percentage of time zero so we see at time zero it's at a hundred percent and uh, so it's just showing how much it goes above that and they are looking at calcium citrate calcium carbonate and calcium forming so calcium formate uh, is not one that you would probably want to take uh, as like a dietary supplement but calcium carbonate and calcium citrate are are probably the two most popular versions of the dietary supplements. Uh, so we see that calcium formate does actually sort of uh, have the highest serum levels. But if we look at the two dietary forms, uh, so we have um, here at, in, the, the, in the boxes, this is the calcium carbonate. And so we can see uh, how that kind of traces along here. Uh, and then we see that the calcium citrate is a little bit better at sort of getting into the serum. And we can see down here that that is sort of a, a function of their solubility. So the calcium carbonate is not very soluble in water at 25 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature. Uh, body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius for those Americans in in the audience who don't know their uh, metric, where we see that the calcium citrate solubility is, uh, you know, like like an order of magnitude or better higher than the calcium carbonate. Uh, but then we also see that the calcium formate is actually even at zero degrees Celsius is actually extremely soluble, and so. These up here are grams per liter. This is actually grams per 100 milliliters. And so that's like, you know, extremely more uh, soluble in water. And so that's why you see that that is, you know, up here. Uh, and so it's this sort of solubility that kind of determines the bioavailability of these different supplements here. And so that's why calcium citrate is... Uh, sort of the uh, it's it generally is thought to be a better version of like a calcium supplement and so we can see the citrate counter uh, counter anion here uh, and so yeah that uh, has to do with sort of the supplementation which I know when it comes to nutrition that's like a big thing that people are always interested in is you know supplementation and how much do I get uh, how much benefit do I get from supplementation and things like that and so that was calcium absorption as I said there is a ton more to this that I haven't gotten into that would just make this video you know I could probably make like like a three-hour video just you know just on like calcium absorption. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to magnesium absorption. And so once again, we have kind of these, kind of the same thing. Uh, so we have this TRPM7, uh, and this is TRPMG. I think they meant TRPM6, because I looked for TRPMG and found nothing, but all the literature talks about TRPM7 and TRPM6 as sort of the active transport of magnesium into the cells here. Uh, and then, of course, we have the paracellular pathway, which for magnesium, so that's the pathway that goes between, uh, between the enterocytes in the, um, in the small intestine. 
And so these are the ways that, that magnesium enter and paracellular way is uh, sort of the main way. And uh, so one thing to keep in mind is that paracell the paracellular way is, uh, is completely um, concentration dependent. So it's what is uh, known as being uh, non-saturable. So you can't like completely saturate it. Whereas like the TRPM7 and TRPM6, you can saturate. So there's sort of a maximum uh, level of intake that those ones can reach. Uh, and so those are called saturable. And in this uh, paper here, it does talk about, you know, these different uh, exogenous and endogenous factors that control sort of the intake of magnesium and once again that's another one of those things that could you know make this video just uh, considerably longer if I went into each and every one of those things so uh, I encourage you to look at the references if you're uh, more interested in that so over here I have this kind of um, well I mean I have this down here so so yeah, like I said, a saturable transcellular active pathway and a non-saturable paracellular passive pathway. So the paracellular pathway, which is regulated by the paracellular tight junctions uh, and the fine-tuned magnesium uptake occurs in the cecum and colon of the large intestine via transcellular pathway. And so this is saying that this paracellular pathway is primarily the way that magnesium is taken up in the small intestine where these transcellulars, so the, uh, the TRPM 6 and 7, is primarily used in the large intestine. Uh, all right, so over here, so intestinal magnesium absorption occurs predominantly in the small intestine via a paracellular pathway, and smaller amounts are absorbed in the colon mainly via the transcellular pathway. In humans, magne magnesium absorption starts approximately one hour after oral intake, reaches a plateau after two to two and a half hours, up to four to five hours, and declines at six hours. The magnesium absorption is approximately 80% complete. With a daily intake of 370 milligrams, the absorption of rate of magnesium in the intestine reaches from 30 to 50 percent. However, the efficiency of magnesium uptake is dependent on the ingested dose. For example, early studies with a low dietary magnesium intake show that the relative absorption rate can reach 80 percent, whereas it is reduced to 20 percent with magnesium excess. And so essentially you don't want too much magnesium all at once because you're just going to end up excreting a lot of the excess there. In general, magnesium is absorbed as an ion. It is not known if the mineral is absorbed together with other nutrients or if magnesium is absorbed in the form of complexes. And so with, uh, with the counter uh, sort of uh, anions. All right, so this is uh, sort of comparing with what we saw with the calcium. So dietary magnesium intake averages 300 milligrams daily. However, depending on the dietary magnesium load, absorption varies between 11 and 65 percent. As with calcium, magnesium can be absorbed passively or it can be actively transported with the majority of magnesium being absorbed from the small intestine to a lesser extent in the colon. Uh, so we see that the normal blood, uh, blood magnesium level is 1.7 to 2.2 uh, milligrams per deciliter, whereas with calcium, it was 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. So I also wanted to put this in here because uh, there is this thing that I've heard before about how calcium and magnesium sort of, uh, sort of compete with each other. And if you have too much of one, then it limits the absorption of the other. So I found this in a paper. So the number of studies investigating dietary factors with a negative influence on the availability of uptake of magnesium is limited. Early studies reported that increasing magnesium or calcium in the diet significantly depressed magnesium absorption. The same depressive effect on magnesium absorption was shown with excess phosphorus, iron, copper, manganese, and zinc. However, in these studies, so this is like a, uh, a review paper talking about different you know, talking about several different studies. 
unphysiological doses of the minerals were used. Uh, so when essentially what it said is that when they saw this depressed effect of magnesium absorption uh, when also taking calcium, these were using unphysiological doses of the minerals, so like uh, extremely high doses. When these substances are consumed within physiological range, such as present in a regular diet, the inhibiting effects have not been observed. For example, long-term magnesium balance studies with calcium doses greater than one milligram per day did not produce a negative uh, a negative effect on magnesium uptake. Uh, so this paper here demonstrated in a human study with 26 adolescent girls that high calcium intake had no relevant impact on measures of magnesium utilization, including the absorption rate or urinary or fecal excretion. Likewise, a balanced study with adolescent girls showed that high calcium intake did not alter magnesium kinetics or balance compared to a calcium intake of 800 milligrams per day. So essentially it's saying that if you're just getting your normal physiological doses of calcium and magnesium, this uh, sort of competitive uh, inhibition of each of them is not actually observed, that you have to have this unphysiological uh, dosage, so this extremely high dose of the minerals uh, in order to actually observe that. So let's get back to the magnesium. Uh, so let's look here at the, uh, so this is the act of transport with the TRPM7. Uh, and so TRPM7, this is just kind of a broad overview of what that, uh, what that ion channel actually looks like. Uh, so we can see where the membrane is, where it's embedded in the membrane, and then this is inside the cell, and then this is outside the cell. And so this shows uh, calcium and magnesium actually going through it. And actually, it can also allow zinc through. So the TRPM7 and TRPM6 are both notable for being uh, what are called divalent uh pores or channels and so they allow calcium 2 plus magnesium 2 plus and zinc 2 plus to move through them so uh, they are one of uh, there are actually quite a few different zinc uh, channels that uh, actually allow zinc in but this is one of those channels that can allow zinc into the cell uh, but we are sort of looking at this in in the context of magnesium and so the other interesting thing about both TRPM6 and 7 is they have this kinase domain. So kinase uh, being a, an enzyme that can phosphorylate things. It can actually phosphorylate itself on this uh, serine threonine rich region uh, of the C-terminal domain. So down here, a unique aspect of both TRPM7 and 6 is the presence of a functional alpha kinase domain on the channel's C terminus. Uh, so autophosphorylation of TRPM7, so that would be this uh, phosphorylating itself, so auto self phosphorylation occurs at multiple serine threonine residues, many of which are clustered in a serine threonine rich domain proximal to the kinase domain. Uh, phosphorylation at the serine threonine rich domain facilitates substrate binding for the TRPM7 kinase. And so essentially by phosphorylating itself, it's activating itself to phosphorylate other things. Uh, and so substrates, so the other things, uh, include non-muscle myosin heavy chain 2A, uh, annexin 1, phospholipase C gamma 2, histones, uh, so those are the things that DNA is bound with, and elongation factor 2 kinase. Uh, so uh, these things can actually be, this kinase can actually be cleaved off of the uh, TRPM7 and it actually localizes to the nucleus and can modify histones to modify uh, transcription of different genes. So kinase functions when cleaved from the channel by caspase-defendant proteolytic cleavage. The liberated 
uh, TRPM7 kinase localized to the nucleus where it remodels chromatin, uh, chromatin being uh, DNA and uh, histones sort of together. Uh, kinase activity of the TRPM7 uh, senses and coordinates cellular and systemic responses to magnesium deprivation. Uh, inactivation of TRPM7 kinase affects proteasome-mediated turnover of the channel kinase, its cellular localization in polarized epithelial cells, and its interaction with phospho-binding proteins. So uh, essentially, it this uh, kinase part of the the TRPM7 channel is, you know, it, it I guess, sort of obviously is involved in the regulation of the TRPM7 channel. And so let's look at this channel here. So we saw the full, the full protein up here, but if we sort of uh, remove a lot of this stuff and look at just the channel, so once again, we have the sort of dots here sort of the, as the sort of outside of the channel. And so this actually um, shows the uh, sort of radius of the pore at different distances uh, down the, the pore channel here. And so this is actually looking at, so TRPM7, DVF means divalent free, which essentially just means it's in a buffered solution. Uh, so it does contain, you know, things like magnesium, but at, you know, very small amounts. Uh, then TRPM7 with magnesium just means that magnesium is uh, sort of at a, a higher concentration. Uh, then TRPM7 EDTA, so EDTA is ethylene diamine uh, tetraacetic acid. You may have seen that as an ingredient in some foods. So that's a very strong chelating molecule. So it sort of binds strongly to things like magnesium and calcium so that they essentially are not are not in solution anymore. So it would be sort of a magnesium-free version of this channel here. Uh, but what we see over here is that these are all uh, fairly uh, similar. So uh, I think in the paper it actually said that the differences between the radius of the pore uh, is small enough that it could just be based on, you know, sort of the error of the actual uh, structure determination. But they did look at uh, whether there was magnesium in the pore. So remember the TRPM7 EDTA is sort of uh, supposed to be the magnesium-free version, and then the TRPM7 magnesium is high magnesium, and we can see there is, in fact, a magnesium in the pore there. Uh, so they put that little grid around it. That's the electron density, where there is no electron density in this one, so there is no magnesium in the pore there. Yeah, and so that is sort of how the pore of the TRPM7 functions. Uh, so then there is this other one. So the tight junctions and the cloudins, which are a type of protein in these tight junctions. So this is the paracellular transport here. And so what we see, uh, these red are the cloudins. Uh, then we can see there's you know a bunch of other proteins that are involved in these tight junctions. So tight junctions are named thus because they sort of hold cells together. Uh, you know, they're kind of the thing that glues the cells together in order to make it sort of a sort of, uh, you know, tissue rather than just a sort of a lump of, you know, cells that can kind of slide past each other the way that, you know, cancer cells often do. Uh, so this is actually an over or a, a structural alignment of of these cloudins. So uh, what was it? Yeah, so the human cloudin 9, uh, the closed and open red. So it's open because it's bound with this uh, C-terminal uh, receptor binding domain of a clostridium perfinogens uh, enterotoxin. And so that uh, they, it's removed from on here, but the enterotoxin, I think, is bound, like, right there. Uh, and so 
I don't remember if it was that side or that side, but it's bound onto there. And uh, essentially what this paper was looking at was how this, uh, this Clostridium perfinogens, which is a bacteria, sort of a, a harmful bacteria. So one of its uh, toxins can actually sort of, uh, sort of change the permeability of these tight junctions to different things. Uh, and, you know, that could obviously in the intestines then cause things like diarrhea and stuff like that. If, you know, different things are allowed to sort of escape through here back out into the intestines. Uh, but anyway, so this, I had a really hard time finding anything about sort of the actual, I guess, biochemical structural mechanism of how these cloud ends, which are sort of the main um, proteins involved in sort of the paracellular uh, absorption uh, or secretion, if the case may be. Uh, I had a hard time finding anything about the actual sort of mechanism of that. This was from a paper that uh, pretty much had the best thing that I could find about it. Um, and so it's, it's essentially saying that the pore pathway uh, when it's like less than eight angstroms is, you know, when it's functioning. If it's leaking, it's, you know, sort of, I guess, uh, between eight and a hundred angstroms. And then, of course, there's unrestricted pathway. Uh, you could think of this as maybe like a cancer cell, uh, which you can see is sort of detached uh, from these other cells. That's one of the things about, that's sort of a hallmark of cancer, is that cancer cells don't really stay where they're supposed to go, which is, you know, why they metastasize and move to other things. But anyway, uh, so this here, uh, I guess part B, uh, where we see here this pore is, you know, this is kind of the best uh, sort of image I could find that actually shows how these cloud ends, uh, so these these alpha helices here all the, all, are all these uh, these cloud and um, proteins here uh, generate these pores here, which would be what allows, say, the magnesium to move through. Uh, and of course, other ions, sodium and potassium and calcium and, and things like that, probably zinc and so forth. Uh, but anyway, so that is sort of how the uh, paracellular passive transport uh, of magnesium works, where that, as I said, is occurring mostly in the small intestine and where the majority of magnesium is actually being absorbed. Uh, I wasn't able to find anything similar to what I did for calcium, like this, like for supplementation. Uh, I couldn't even find good solubilities for the main sorts of, uh, of magnesium supplements you know, things like magnesium glycinate and magnesium uh, threonate and things like that. Uh, so I wasn't even able to find good uh, solubility data for those. So I couldn't even sort of make a conjecture uh, as to which one would actually be sort of the better absorption. And I tend to try not to look at, you know, like Kelsey or like supplement blogs and things like that, which, you know, a, a lot of times they will, they will put on their websites, you know, different studies and stuff like that. And, you know, this study says that, you know, this is the best kind. And, uh, well, it just so happens that that's also the kind that we sell. Uh, and so that's why I tend to try to steer away from, from like studies put on like blogs and, you know, store, online stores and stuff that are selling these supplements because uh, it just, it seems a little too biased that way. I would rather, if I could, you know, find the studies themselves on my own and uh, try to, you know, get rid of that bias from it. And so, you know, I'm sure if you did like a Google search for, you know, magnesium bioavailability or magnesium absorption, you could probably find a hundred different web pages, you know, touting this, that, or the other form of magnesium supplement being the best version. But, 
you know, like I said, you're going to get like differential results depending on where you look and it's going to be all kinds of biases and stuff involved. So uh, I decided to just leave that out of this presentation. Uh, I know that's a little disappointing and it's kind of disappointing to me too that I couldn't really find like a good sort of unbiased study on this because it's something that I'm interested in. Uh, in which magnesium supplement is sort of the the best for absorption and bioavailability and things like that. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, that's just kind of the world we live in that we uh, have all these different biases and different people trying to grab your attention and say ours is the best and you know, that's why you should buy ours and things like that. But uh, anyway, yeah, so I guess the other thing to notice here, we do have the CNNM4, which is sort of how the magnesium gets from the cell into the bloodstream, and that is a sodium anti-porter. Uh, so anti-porter, which is kind of like what the uh, sodium potassium uh, transporter is. So you'll sometimes see those uh, called anti-porters because it moves one ion one way and then the other one in the opposite direction. So you can see this is moving sodium into the bloodstream and then this is moving sodium back out of the bloodstream. And so uh, it's using sort of the, uh, the energy from those, uh, from the differential concentrations. Remember the sodium concentration inside the cell is much smaller than it is outside the cell. And so it's using sort of the energy of sodium going from the high concentration to the low concentration in order to move magnesium in the opposite direction. And so that's kind of what an anti-porter is. Uh, but anyway, um, I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, maybe it helped clear some things up for you as far as uh, as, as calcium and magnesium absorption uh, and as far as you know like what is the role of vitamin D so we have this vitamin D here we see that that is involved in protein synthesis uh, for one thing uh, and so it's used as like a transcription factor or act or, or it activates transcription factors that then go into the nucleus and sort of synthesize proteins uh, for instance, this calbinin D9K, uh, this PMCA1B, which is actually what moves the calcium from in the cell to the bloodstream, uh, and, the, and it's uh, involved in the TRPV6. Uh, so it's involved in the synthesis of TRPV6. So it's involved in the expression of all these proteins. And so uh, that is why the vitamin D D is, uh, is, that's why this TRPV6 I put here is vitamin D dependent, uh, as are the things like the uh, Kelbinin D9K and the PMCA1B. Uh, so the, that, um, yeah, so the PMCA1B is the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. Uh, then the calbinin D9K is the vitamin D dependent calcium binding protein. And so we see that that is all vitamin D dependent. Uh, whereas this pathway, which uh, this paper was sort of just characterizing and saying that this one is also involved, is vitamin, seems to be at least so far vitamin D independent. Uh, I believe there were some sort of uh, vitamin D deficient studies where they looked at cells in vitamin D deficient um, conditions and saw that this, uh, this other pathway, this CAV 1.3, uh, was still able to absorb vitamin D. Uh, but anyway, um, I think that is enough for this video. As you can see, it's already pretty long. I could, like I said, I could go on on both of these things, calcium and magnesium, for much, much longer. But uh, I think this is at least uh, an introduction to the relevant information. Uh, so I will see you in another video.